Hello, and thank you for joining us for today's presentation, part of our Agilent Cell Analysis Global Conference. My name is Alex Liversage, and I'm the UK and Ireland Seahorse Instrument Specialist for the Cell Analysis Division at Agilent. And I'll be your host for this, the first in a series of presentations throughout the day. Before I introduce our first speaker, allow me to share a bit about Agilent and our products for cell analysis. Agilent, as a leader in life sciences, is very focused on enabling our customers to gain the insights they seek. Our rapidly growing cell analysis portfolio enables deeper, more reliable insights across a variety of cell analysis applications where investigators and drug developers seek to understand dynamic cellular environments and interactions. This is critically important in the large and growing immuno-oncology and immunotherapy fields. So, for example, discovering safe, potent and persistent immune cell products require a more comprehensive understanding of cancer biology and immune cell function. To that end, our presenters today will speak specifically to how our solutions are being employed in that context. I'm pleased today to welcome Dr. Ping Che Ho as our first presenter of the day. Ping Che joins us today from the University of Lausanne in Switzerland. And following his move there from Yale University in 2015, his group has expanded his interest in immuno-oncology with the aim to establish a fundamental understanding on how tumor cells evade immunosurveillance through their metabolism and how it's possible to reprogram the metabolic machinery of immune cells to improve, improve immunotherapy. In this presentation, Ping Che will present data on regulatory T cells and their substrate utilization within the tumor microenvironment. One last thing before I hand over to Ping Che, there will be a question and answer period immediately following this talk. And to help us to get through as many of your questions as possible, we would encourage you to type in your questions throughout uh, Ping Che's presentation. With that, I'll hand over the presentation to Ping Che. Hello, everyone. Uh, so it's my pleasure to present uh, our work with you, and then hopefully you can enjoy it. And then uh, please also feel free to uh, put uh, your question, and I'll be happy to answer the question in the end of the talk, OK? So, so first of all, uh, I would like to introduce uh, uh, where my lab is. Actually, we are in Lausanne, so it's part of Switzerland, the French-speaking part. So we are very close to the uh, Geneva. And my lab is mainly focused on immunometabolism and also uh, how we can exploit the information we have in immunometabolism for cancer immunotherapy and also understand uh, also try to understand how tumor cells can utilize their regulation in the metabolic process of immune cells to formulate uh, the formation of immunosuppressive tumor microenvironment. And today I will talk about our new story, which just published recently, about how intratumor TREC uh, can be targeted by the metabolic uh, intervention. And this is my disclosure slide. And before I jump into the data about our study, I would like to give you some idea about how we consider uh, a proper immune response against tumor should, should be done. So actually, if we want to have a very uh, effective anti-tumor immunity, we should consider that those tumor-specific CDAT cells, for example, they need to get proper infiltration into the tumor uh, microenvironment. At the same time, they also need to get proper activation within the battlefield, they have to fight against those malignant cancer cells. However, this kind of actions will be compromised by multiple microenvironmental challenges as listed here. The first one is metabolic restriction and hypoxia. So based upon the study I did before and also other group they did uh, in the past few years, we already start to appreciate that the tumor microenvironment can be deprived for different nutrients, especially glucose can be one of the representative nutrients which is deprived. And this represents a major challenge for the uh, tumor-specific T cells once they enter to the tumor microenvironment because those tumor-specific T cells, they still need to use those nutrients to support their expansion, activation, and also uh, production of effector molecules. And hypoxia also can become a very uh, difficult microenvironmental challenge for those infiltrating immune cells. And the other microenvironmental challenge is poor T cell infiltration and engagement of co-inhibitory signals in the T cells. So those microenvironmental challenges actually can prevent 
uh, properties and filtration by manipulating the vessel integrity. At the same time, the presentation, uh, the, the expression of PDL1 in cancer cells and also other myeloid cells and other cohibitor receptors can also further dampen the anti tumor response of the T cells in the tumor microenvironment. And the third microenvironment challenge people can also appreciate is the accumulation of immunomodulatory cells in a tumor microenvironment. And one of the major topics I would like to talk today is also this immunomodulatory cells, which is Tregs. So Tregs, as well as myeloid derived suppressor cells and to macrophage and tyrogenic dendritic cells, they play different kinds of immunomodulatory roles in a tumor microenvironment, which can further support the formation of immunosuppressive stages of the tumors. And they apparently accumulate in a tumor microenvironment through different mechanisms. And how to target those immunomodulatory cells becomes another very important approach to control uh, or to boost our host anti-tumor immunity. So I would like to move to the targets I would like to cover today, regulatory T cells. And actually, regulatory T cells represent a major immuno immunomodulatory cells in our immune system because they have different function to control the, the overactivation of our immune system. For example, as listed here, those t regulatory T cells, they can control dendritic cell macrophage phenotype through different uh, effector molecules or through the direct uh, lysis activity. At the same time, regulatory T cells can also control vessel and also T cell behavior through other mechanisms. So I will not go through all the details, but I want to let you know the presence of regulatory T cells play a very important role to compromise ongoing inflammatory response and also try to fine tune uh, the, the actions of, of our immune system. So you can imagine that the presence of regulatory T cells play a very important role to prevent autoimmunity because once we don't have those regulatory T cells, you will start to see overt immune activation by modulating multiple immune cells. However, in the tumor microenvironment, we can see tons of regulatory T cells in the tumor, as I mentioned before. And this is a typical example. So this is a breast cancer staining. So the top side is the normal uh, tissue, breast tissue. And the bottom part is the uh, breast cancer. And you can see in the breast cancer, to, uh, in the breast cancer, you see tons of the regulatory T cells accumulate which is labeled in the brown because this is a FOXP3 staining, which is a marker enzyme, uh, marker transmission factors uh, control regulatory T cell formation, stability, and actor, the, the action. So this result has been shown uh, in multiple tumors. Those tumor uh, sections, you can see tons of regulatory T cell accumulate, which associate with poor prognosis and more immunosuppressive tumor microenvironment. So based on this information, people start to wonder, maybe we should target regulatory T cells to improve host anti-tumor immune response because we can alleviate those immunosuppressive features in the tumor microenvironment. However, these type of treatments lead to several issues. First of all, the TREC targeting approach will also induce systemic TREC depletion, which might induce autoimmunity. In addition, the TREC targeting approach so far for the tumor migraine, for the intratumor TREC is not as effective as we initially think. So based upon this information, we realize that actually there's a very strong need to identify therapeutic intervention or therapeutic strategy, which can allow us to target intratumor TREC while keeping TREC in other peripheral tissue intact. Because in this case, we can avoid all the side effects you observe in those TREC targeting approach so far people use. So when we start to come up with this, this idea, we start to wonder whether we can put metabolism as a part of this therapeutic targeting approach. And the reason we have this kind of crazy and also interesting idea because we realize that regulatory T cell can reside in multiple uh, tissue or organs as illustrated here. So you can find regulatory T cells not only in the lymph node, you also can find them in brain, in muscle, in skin, adipose tissue, gut, and spleen. And they actually exert distinct tissue dependent uh, suppressive activity or tissue context dependent um, activity to control tissue homeostasis. So based upon this information, we start to wonder, 
there must be something which can control regulatory tissue behavior in a tissue context specific manner. So when we consider the entire distribution, we realize that those places, they have different nutrient availability. And those cells in different organs can also produce different waste and also preferentially spare certain nutrient in the environment. So if I'm a T-Rex, I go to a place, if in order to survive, I need to get something I can eat in a particular location. So that's why we wonder maybe t rag behave like that. They will change their nutrient preference based upon where they live. If this is the case in the tumor microenvironment, this is the lactate-enriched glucose might be deprived place with a lot of hypoxia and also lipid-enriched uh, condition. Those regulated T cells might engage specific metabolic machinery, which allow them to survive and even uh, promotes their suppressive activity in a tumor microenvironment. And this kind of metabolic process will not be used by T-Rex uh, residing in other place. So we call this process metabolic ad adaptation. So our hypothesis was very simple. Do T-Rex engage metabolic adaptation in response to the microenvironmental cue in different tissue? If this is true, maybe we can find this special metabolic adaptation used by intratumor T-Rex and then secondly destroy this intratumor T-Rex by intervening this adaptation. So based upon this idea, we first analyze whether we can see this phenotype and this uh, metabolic skewing uh, in human samples. So we decided to reanalyze the RNA sequencing data done by Sasha Rudensky published in Immunity in 2016. In this paper, uh, Sasha, they did analysis by collecting Treg from breast cancer patients and also the PBMC. They perform RNA sequencing in this study that focus on chemokine receptors. But by reanalyzing this data, we pay extra attention on the metabolic machinery which should be used by intratumor Treg, but not in the PBMC Treg. Surprisingly, we found that majority of metabolic pathway which will be selectively engaged by intratumor T-Rex from these breast cancer patient samples is lipid metabolism. So you can see on the left-hand side, lipid metabolic process, lipid response, lipid binding, those genes are highly expressed by intratumor T-Rex in this breast cancer patient cohort. And the right-hand side is the gene set enrichment analysis. So you can further appreciate that the fatty acid metabolic process and also lipid binding uh, gene set a highly enriched intratumor T-Rex compared with PBMC T-Rex. So based on this information, we start to wonder, maybe intratumor T-Rex will engage unique lipid metabolism to support their survival and function in the tumor microenvironment. In this analysis, we will also focus on lipid transporter because if this is the tr if this is true, T-Rex might produce lipid by themselves or get lipid from outside. And when we did this analysis, we realized that there's only one lipid transporter can be significantly increased by intratumor T-Rex, which is CD36. At the same time, we also see upper regulation of FABP4 and 5, which is the uh, lipid chaperone, uh, help those cells to uh, store and traffic lipid in the, in, in the intracellular compartment. So based upon this information, we first confirmed whether CD36 protein expression level indeed increased in intratumor T-Rex. In addition to the RNA sequencing analysis, we reanalyzed from the breast cancer patient samples. So what we did was very simple. We used the tumor engraftment system. We engraft wire type B6 mice with melanoma cells. 18 days later, we isolate T-Rex from different locations and check their CD36 expression as well as lipid content and lipid uptake. And here you see is the CD36 staining. So the, this is draining infernal and also non-draining infernal. And we also compare spleen, thymus, skin, and tumor. And we observe robust increase of CD36 expression in T-Rex isolated from tumor compared with T-Rex from other place. In addition, we also can see this phenotype if we analyze melanoma patient samples. And the left-hand side here is a representative facts plot. And the right-hand side, uh, as I show you here, each line indicates is a pair sample. So the white dot is the T-Rex in PBMC, 
and the black one is Tmax in tumor infiltrate uh, in the in a tumor microenvironment. So compare uh, the CD36 expression between these two samples from the same patient. We can see that majority of patients we analyze of melanoma patients, they have increased CD36 expression in intratumor Tmax, which is also holding true in mouse model. So with this information, we start to believe intratumor Tmax may preferentially engage a CD36 dependent meta metabolic reprogramming to support their accumulation in a tumor microenvironment. As I told you, CD36 is a lipid translocase. So based upon this information, we further test whether lipid content and lipid uptake also increase. And indeed, they also in, those intratumor Tmax also increase their lipid content and lipid uh, uptake compared with the Tmax in PBMC and also Tmax in other places if we use mouse model. So with this information, we decided to take a look whether CD36 indeed control this entire process. So we generate a T-Rex specific CD36 knockout by crossing CD36 flux flux mice with flux P3 YFP Cree. In this case, the YFP Cree expression will drive a T-Rex specific CD36 knockout. Since I told you flux P3 is the key transcription factors to control T-Rex differentiation. So in this case, we can generate a T-Rex specific knockout and then we use the flux P3 YFP Cree mice as a wire type recipient for the following test. And what we did was very simple. We first engraft melanoma cells, which is a BRAF uh, V600 mutation with P10, de with P10 deletion. And we engraft the same amount of cancer cells into either wild type mice or T-Rex specific CD36 knockout. And after 18 days, we isolate T-Rex from tumor and other organs, including spleen, lymph node, and also blood. And we first confirmed that only intratumor T-Rex from CD36 NAGA reduced lipid content and lipid uptake. So this is lipid content and this is lipid uptake. And this reduction can only be, can only be seen in the intratumor T-Rex because in spleen, in draining lymph node, non-draining lymph node, and also blood, those T-Rex have very similar lipid uptake and, lipid binding, uh, and also lipid content between white type and NAGA. So this result further suggests that intratumor Tmax selectively increase CD36, and the presence of CD36 in those intratumor Tmax support the lipid uptake and lipid content in those intratumor Tmax. In addition to the functional test, we also observed that those tumors engrafted in the Tmax specific CD36 knockout mice have slower growth kinetics and in the end of the experiments, the tumor weight is also much lower compared with wild type mice. When we just knock out one single gene in T-Rex cells. So this result further prompts us uh, to take a look what happened, why intratumor T-Rex, which can express CD36, will lead to this entire anti-tumor response become stronger. So we take a look to see the T-Rex abundance by analyzing the FOXP3YP signal uh, in splenocyte, draining lymph node uh, T cells, and also the tumor infiltrating lymphocyte. By comparing those uh, populations, we didn't see any difference in terms of the T-Rex abundance between uh, wild type and knockout in spleen and draining lymph node. However, we start to see 40% reduction of T-Rex abundance in CD36 NACA when we analyze the tumor infiltrating T-Rex. So this result suggests that only intratumor T-Rex needs CD36. Once we delete CD36 in T-Rex, you will start to see less intratumor T-Rex accumulation, but you didn't abolish the formation and retention of T-Rex in other uh, peripheral lymph nodes. With this information, we start to believe that maybe targeting CD36 can be a good strategy to destroy intratumor T-Rex while keeping the T-Rex in other place intact. However, abundance is only abundance. We cannot guarantee those T-Rex you observe here, uh, they still they don't express CD36 in uh, lymph node or in spleen, they still function as a normal T-Rex to suppress the immune response. So in order to examine whether those T-Rex in peripheral tissue they can still suppress the ongoing environmental response. 
we did a few tests, and this is one of the tests we did. We, do the, we did a T-cell transfer colitis system. In this case, we can transfer an naive CD4 T-cell into REC1 knockout. Once we transfer naive CD4 T-cell into REC1 knockout due to the lymphopenia condition in REC1 knockout, CD4 T-cell will start to expand, and this expansion will lead to activation of T-cells, and they will also drive uh, gut inflammatory response. So you will start to see the IBD um, syndrome, and then they will also start to reduce their body weight. So as you can see here, when we transfer naive CD4 T-cell, the body weight of those mice reduced. And this can be prevented if we co-transfer Y-type T-Rex, or when we tra co-transfer those naive CD4 T-cells with CD36 knockout T-Rex. And this can be further examined by checking the macroscopic uh, phenotype of gut, uh, colon, and also small intestine. As you can see here, once we transfer naive CD4 T-cell alone, you start to see the immune infiltration, and the colon and small intestine lose their morphology. But this can be prevented when we co-transfer naive CD4 T-cell with wild-type T-Rex or CD36 knockout T-Rex. So this result suggests that CD36 expression is, is not important for those peripheral T-Rex. They still can exert uh, suppressive act actions to prevent ongoing inflammatory response in gut in this T-cell transfer colitis system. And due to the time, uh, I didn't show you, I will not show you the data about other assays that we did, but basically we also checked the body weight loss in the aged mice. We didn't see any difference between wild type and knockout mice. And we also checked the T-cell expansion and activation profile in the aged mice, and we, don't, we also didn't see any difference. And the morphology of those mice in the major organ, they are also the same. So basically, our data suggests that those T-Rex in peripheral tissue, they don't need CD36. But it looks like intratumor T-Rex, they require CD36 expression to support their maintenance. So based on this information, we decided to move into the next one, try to understand why Intratumor T-Rex, they can, they need CD36 to, to support their maintenance. So we isolate uh, intratumor T-Rex from wire type mice uh, and also CD36 uh, T-Rex specific knockout mice. So from those remaining viable intratumor T-Rex, we can see based on the RNA sequencing data, those intratumor T-Rex, which don't express CD36, they start to increase the expression of genes associated with apoptosis pathway, as you can see on, this, on the, on the left-hand side of this slide. So based on this information, we, we, we realized that maybe the deficiency of CD36 can drive apoptosis in the intratumor T-Rex. So we used two different methods to confirm that. So, so we did the active CASPAS3 staining and also checked the annexin 5 staining in those remaining intratumor T-Rex in, uh, between Y-type and also CD36 NACA. So in this analysis, we found that T-Rex-specific CD36 NACA mice, they have higher level of intratumor T-Rex display active caspas 3 staining and also a uh, higher level of annexin 5 staining. So this result suggests that without CD36, we start to reduce 40% of intratumor T-Rex but the remaining 60%, they are dying. So with this information, we start to wonder why this lipid transporter can do that, how the, this, this lipid transporter expressed by T-Rex can control the survival of T-cells, especially in the regulatory T-cell compartment. So in order to answer this question, we did many different tests, but none of them works. Until we perform electron microscope to take a look what kind of change we can observe in those T cells, which in which they, they don't express CD36. So as you can see here on the left-hand side, this is an electron microscopy analysis. So this is wire-type uh, wire T-Rex isolated from spleen versus CD36 deficient T-Rex isolated from spleen. We didn't observe any difference in terms of their uh, appearance, in terms of a mitochondria content and also the morphology. However, once we isolate those T-Rex from tumor, we start to see huge difference. As you can see here in the, in the bottom part of this slide, those wire type intratumor T-Rex contain a lot of mitochondria, but CD36 deficient intratumor T-Rex reduce the mitochondria content and also start to lose the mitochondria structure, especially the crystal number reduced. 
And the right-hand side is the quantification result. So basically, this result indicates that the expression of this lipid transporter is important to maintain the mitochondria content and also the quality of mitochondria in intratumor T-Rex. In addition, when we perform the assay with the in vitro uh, culture assay, we also start to see some interesting phenotype. As you can see here, so we generate those IT rec from wire type over CD36 knockout, and then we culture them in the normal culture medium, RPMI over RPMI plus hypoxia, which to mimic one of the microenvironmental stress you can observe in the tumor microenvironment. And the other one is that we culture those t racks in the presence of cancer cell conditional medium. In both hypoxia and cancer cell conditional medium, we start to see CD36 deficient t racks reduce the viability. And based upon this analysis, we start to postulate maybe some common factors between hypoxia and also cancer cell conditional medium can induce cell deaths in those CD36 deficient t racks So the major common factors in these two conditions is lactic acid because in hypoxic conditions, cell will generate a lot of lactic acid. And cancer cell conditional medium also contain high number, high amount of lactic acid due to the aerobic glycolysis activity of cancer cells. So with this information, we start to take a look whether lactic acid can really drive this difference in the viability. So we culture the T-Rex from wire type and CD, and CD36 knockout mice in the RPMI conditional medium, RPMI median, normal median, with escalating do uh, dose of lactic acid and we start to see the survival difference between those two T-Rex. So the CD36 knockout T-Rex reduced their survival once we increase the lactic acid level in the median. So this result suggests that they need CD36 to deal with the lactic acid enrichment condition, which is pretty common in the tumor microenvironment. And you may wonder, What's the link between the lactic acid and also the mitochondrial phenotype I told you before? So we also initially think this is something quite interesting and also difficult to be explained. But once we take a look of the biochemistry textbook, we realize that actually everything makes sense. So please follow with me. I think this is something I think is interesting and also makes sense. If you have the basic understanding of the lactate utilization, you will realize that. So if we culture cells in a lactic acid-enriched condition, cell will die due to the acidosis and due to the high lactic acid enrichment uh, microenvironment or in the median, which is quite common if we culture cells uh, in the same culture median too long and we forget to change the median. Our cell will die for that. The main reason is that cell, if we have a lot of lactic acid in the extracellular compartment, lost lactic acid can get into the cell, or they will stay in the cells if those cells produce lactic acid, because they will not, uh, they will not be pumped out based upon the, uh, the uh, lactic gradient. So those lactic acids stay in the cytoplasm will become toxic. However, T-Rex, they are pretty efficient to reduce the toxicity of lactic acid by converting lactic acid into pyruvate. At least has been reported in a cell metabolism paper published uh, last year. So in this study, they showed that FOXP3 can support this metabolic program to allow T-Rex to convert lactic acid into pyruvate. And this can make T-Rex to use lactic acid as a nutrient source. And this process can also make T-Rex to survive in a lactic acid enriched condition. However, in order to engage this metabolic conversion, cells will convert their NAD into NADH. So now it becomes very simple. If a cell they stay in a lactic acid or lactate in rich condition like tumor microenvironment, they will continuously utilize this pathway and generate a lot of NAD. Eventually, you will run out your NAD pool. And this becomes a problem because you need to constantly have NAD to help you to deal with those lactate. So in this case, the mitochondrial activity becomes super important because our electron transport chain complex one, which can support the NADH, NAD regeneration by dehydrogenate the NADH. And this can provide the cycling of NAD. And the action of this process will become super important for T-Rex if they want to continuously utilize lactate and convert lactate into pyruvate. So based upon this information, we postulate 
In CD36 deficient t rex they lose the mitochondrial activity, and this will abolish their ability to regener regenerate NAD in a lactate-enriched condition. And that's why they will start to die due to the high lactic acid enrichment. So in order to confirm that, we first take a look whether the NADH and NAD ratio indeed change between wire type over t rex without CD36 expression. As you can see here, those CD36 deficient T-Rex, they start to increase the NADH level. So this result suggests that they have the difficulty to regenerate NAD to maintain the balance of NAD and NADH ratio. And we also reperform experiments as, as I showed you before. We culture those T-Rex in a cancer cell conditional medium. We start to see the reduction of the survival of those T-Rex. However, this reduction can be reduced if we supplied nicotinamide riboside, which, can, which is a precursor of NAD, can make those cells uh, generate NAD through other mechanism. So in this case, if we resupply NAD level, we will be able to save those T-Rex, which, which, which do not express CD36. So based on this information, we postulate the reason intratumor T-Rex needs CD36 because they want to maintain this mitochondrial action intact, which allow them to survive in a lactic acid enriched tumor microenvironment. And you may wonder what's the reason and how CD36 can control mitochondrial phenotype. So when we look into the old literature related to metabolic uh, tissues, we realize that actually CD36 has been reported to support the lipid uptake, and those lipids actually can be used as a ligand to activate PPAR pathway, which is important to drive mitochondrial biogenesis and mitochondrial activity. So we decided to take a look whether the intratumor t rex indeed have this chance to increase their PPAR signaling cascade activity. So we take a look for the gene cell enrichment in the breast cancer patient again. In this analysis, we see that those breast cancer patients, their intratumor t rex have higher expression level of PPR signaling cascade gene set compared with PBMC t rex So this result suggests that intratumor t rex can display enhanced PPR beta, PPR signature. So we try to find which PPR is the key player to control this process. So we generate PPR beta knockout and also PPR gamma knockout. So for the sake of the time, I will not show you the gamma data, but gamma actually didn't change anything. So we didn't see any defect if those T-Rex can express PPR gamma. However, if we use T-Rex specific PPR beta knockout, we can see the same phenotype as CD36 knockout display, including reduced tumor growth rate, tumor burden, and also the intratumor T-Rex number decrease in those T-Rex which can express CD, uh, in those mice which you can express PPR beta in T-Rex. And PPR beta has been shown to control the mitochondrial biogenesis and mitochondrial activity. So with this information, we suspect that actually CD36 can control the activity of PPR beta. Therefore, it can support the mitochondrial fitness and those T-Rex ability to utilize lactic acid. To confirm that, we decided to take another. We decided to perform another experiment to establish this causal role. So he, what we did was very simple. If CD36 helped the activation of PPR beta, in principle, we should rescue the CD36 deficient mice phenotype by artificially activating PPR beta. So what we did was that we treated those mice, wild type mice or T-Rex specific CD36 knockout mice with PPR beta agonist. So as you can see here, the black versus the red, so we see the tumor burden, uh, tumor growth rate reduced in those mice which don't express CD36 in T-Rex. But once we inject PPR beta agonist, we can restore the tumor growth in CD36 knockout mice. At the same time, we also, we, we also restore the intratumor T-Rex abundance in the CD36 knockout mice when we treat those mice with PPR beta agonist. And we can also reduce the cas active caspase 3 staining in those T-Rex, which don't express CD36. So overall, based on this information, we propose a model. In a tumor microenvironment, for some reason, intratumor T-Rex have to engage this unique metabolic adaptation in which they upregulate CD36, which can help them to activate PPR beta 
And this will allow those intratumor Tmax to sustain mitochondrial activity, to engage mitochondrial biogenesis and stronger mitochondrial activity to recycle NAD from the NADH. And this will become very important action because in a tumor microenvironment, which is lactate enriched condition, those lactate will continuously become pyruvates if those Tmax can still engage this process. However, if we target CD36, we will abolish the CD36 PPR beta signaling and then abolish the mitochondrial fitness in those intratumor Tmax, which will make those Tmax die because they take those lactate. They cannot convert those lactate into pyruvate. They will die based upon what they used to be very good to do. So with this information, we start to believe that targeting this pathway may allow us to selectively destroy intratumor Tmax while keeping the Tmax in other peripheral tissues intact. So with this information, we decided to take a look whether we can find any metabolic intervention which allowed us to target this pathway. And luckily, we find that actually CD36 antibody, which can bind the lipid binding site of the mouse CD36, can also induce the same antitumor response as we see in the genetic mouse model. So when we inject this antibody to block CD36-mediated lipid binding, we reduce the tumor burden. We also selectively suppress the intratumor Tmax accumulation. While the Tmax in spleen and Tmax in draining infant node, they are identical between PBS treatments or CD36 antibody treated group. Importantly, those intratumor t remaining intratumor Tmax from the CD36 antibody injected group, they also increase active caspase 3 staining. So it suggests that this antibody indeed drive intratumor Tmax apoptosis. And when we combine, when we do the treatment with this antibody, we see a very we see a pretty good antitumor response, which is quite, which is already quite promising. Especially we do the same, we do the treatments only every three days with a very low dose. But once we combine the anti-CD36 antibody with PD1 blockade treatments, we basically stabilize the BRAP10-inducible melanoma system, which is a system don't respond to PD-1 blockade. So with this information, we start to believe that we can use this approach as a new uh, immune checkpoint blockade treatment, but this time we target a metabolic checkpoint in intratumor T-Rex. So we can use this approach to reprogram the tumor microenvironment to selectively disrupt, uh, disrupt intratumor T-Rex. And this may serve as a new type of immunotherapy, which we might pursue in a clinical trial and also in the patients with different tumor mod or with different tumor. So in the end, I would like to thank my people, uh, especially my student who did the majority of this work, Hai Pin, and uh, she just defend her thesis and start her postdoc uh, uh, in the microbiota field. And also my another student who also helped us uh, on finalizing the mitochondrial phenotypes. And most importantly, all the collaborators who provide different patient samples and input when we conduct this process, including uh, Freddy Zipadias, Camila, Petro, Jed Wachak, Taha, and also our collaborators who provide uh, new information about the metabolic regulation, uh, Sarah uh, from VIB KB Rubin. And also the funding support. Without their support, it's not possible to conduct this research in a tiny manner. And I will be happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Ping Che. That was a great talk. So um, we'll now start the Q&A portion of the webinar. And if you have a question you'd like to ask, then please submit it. Uh, we'll get through as many uh, questions as we can before the end of the hour. Uh, and even if we don't make it to your questions, we'll be forwarding them on to our speaker and the Greater Agilent team to follow up with you. So let's take a look at our questions that we've got coming in. So, let me see. Uh, here we go. So, one idea. have you any information about head and neck cancers where Treg populations shows positive prognosis? Is there anything that you could mention on that one, Ping Jay? So, you know, it's, it's difficult to say, you know, how people did this retro perspective analysis, but I would say that 
in the tumor, if you see higher Tregs, sometimes it indicates two things. One is that the microenvironment is more immunosuppressive. The other one is that there's an ongoing inflammatory response. That's why you start to see higher red, higher level of Tregs. So I think the positive, a positive prognosis in head neck cancer may be the, the later case. Probably there are some infiltration of CDA T cell which can induce uh, inflammatory response in the tumor microenvironment. That's why you start to see some Tregs that try to show up and then try to compromise this ongoing anti-tumor response. That's why you see the uh, positive correlation. But I think this will rely on a lot of um, further analysis. And one thing we also need to be careful, which we learned from the colon cancer, is that actually in colon cancer, the, the initially people also believe that there's a positive correlation between the Treg abundance and also the survival. But this is basically, um, done by the FOXP3 expression. But we have to realize that in, humans, in human T cells, when they get activation, they also start to express FOXP3 at uh, the early activation. So the FOXP3 expression doesn't mean they are T-Rex. You need to use other markers. That's why uh, Simon Sakakuchi, they, they, they did this uh, uh, analysis beautifully in the Nature Medicine paper. They showed that you need to see those activated T-Rex. If you use the activated T-Rex signature, you will start to see that this signature negatively associated with the prognosis in colon cancer patients. So this will redefine how we think about this biomarker. Okay, great. Um, another question here is uh, specifically towards CD36. Is that also expressed in CD4 and CD8 T cells uh, as well as uh, T Rex? CD4, we are not really sure. Uh, I don't remember if we checked the non T Rex CD4. It must be in our standing panel, but I didn't check that one. But in CD8 T cells, we know that they will also express CD36. And this, uh, this increase may do something uh, to hamper CD8 T cell activity. Okay. Uh, here's one, I mean, you were looking at uh, that kind of goes to more mitochondrial uh, number and fitness. Did you also measure at all um, functional activity of those mitochondria using uh, OCAR, ECAR readouts at all? Or anything so did, that's a great question. So we did this one. Uh, so actually, if those uh, those T Rex they don't express CD thirty six, they start to have mitochondria problems. As you as you as you can see in the uh, EN data, so actually they also drop, they also reduce their OCAR. They start to increase their ECAR. So our our theory is that if they have the mitochondria problem, they will start to use glucose more efficiently than the wild type mice, a uh, wild type T Rex. In this case, it can be good and also can be bad. And good for them is that they probably will engage stronger suppressive activity, but it's not, it's not what we observe. However, uh, they probably also have you can use this approach to suppress the, the, the immune, immune response, especially CDAT cell, by depriving the glucose level uh, mm -hmm. in the tumor microenvironment. But the bad thing is that actually tumor microenvironment is already glucose deprived. So I don't know whether this kind of switch will be good for Direct. My, my, my imagination is that they will try to survive, but actually for the long run, this might not be good because they probably still will encounter the same problem CDAT so encounter. They don't get sufficient glucose to support their survival and function. Mm -hmm. Do you have any indication of how quickly that switch kind of occurs from going from a T-Reg in the PBMC population into, I mean, is there any... I, I have no idea how quickly this can happen. So I think it might take some time because initially you probably still have sufficient lipid to, to activate your PPR beta. But you need to have uh, other pathway they, um, to degrade those ligands or consume those ligands. So I would say, I would imagine that this will take a while, but how long? I don't know. Okay. Um, what have we got here? So we have. Uh... Did the CD36 knockout have an effect on CD39 expression? That's a good question. We didn't check, but we checked the expression of suppressive markers in, C in CD36 knockout uh, T-Rex. So in addition to the T-cell transfer colitis, we also perform in vitro, I should say, ex vivo suppressive activity for T-cell proliferation. So the splenic T-Rex, from wild type and knockout, they have similar ability to suppress T cell proliferation. However, in tumor T-Rex, if they don't have CD36, they reduce the suppressive activity. And we don't know whether this is due to CD39 expression, but at least we know that they start to express lower level of ketone, X40. At least we know this too. 
Thank you. So, uh, what have we got here? Da, da, da. Somebody would like to ask that in tissues like adipose tissue and liver, uh, CD4 and CD8 T cells overexpress CD36. So, does targeting CD36 in patient can it also affect the function? So it's possible based upon the, for example, adipose tissue, we probably know that the adipose tissue T-Rex also express CD36. Um, but whether this CD36 expression do something for those T-Rex in adipose tissue is not clear because um, the knockout mice doesn't really show any phenotype and I didn't see any uh, strong phenotype has been reported before. And so I'm not really sure, but in terms of safety of this targeting approach, I think it's, it can be, we can consider it, it might be quite safe because in human, especially in Asian and also African, one in 1,000 people, they, uh, uh, you will see uh, CD36 deficiency and they are viable, which is very similar to the mouse. Uh, the only problem is that when you do blood transfusion, they will have some issues for the, um, for the, after, the trans, after the blood transfusion. But I think overall, CD36 looks like they, they, are, they can be a pretty safe target because then the whole body deficiency patient you can see. Okay, next question. Uh, have you seen any functional difference in terms of suppressive activity between CD36 positive and negative T regs? Suppressive activity, right? Yes. So, uh, as I say, the, uh, the tumor infiltrating T-Rex, we see it. We see the different suppressive activity. Um, but the, the reduction is, is not as strong as uh, other uh, systemic T-Rex deficiency, uh, for example, box P3 deficiency or, or uh, CTRF or knockout. So we see something, but it's not, I think it's not, a major, it's not a major effect of CD36 deficiency. Uh, which can lead to a stronger anti-tumor response. I think this, the survival of T-Rex might be the major issue, rather than the suppressive activity decline. Okay. Uh, done that one. Um, where are we? How about this? So, uh, would epigenetic, epigenetic modification on PDCD1, gene coding for PD1, affect checkpoint therapy in any way? If you can see that one yourself. Okay, so I think that, that that's possible, especially, you know, it has been shown by other people like John Worry, uh, Ben Youngblood, and also in general Rao that, you know, uh, T cell exhaustion actually linked with the epigenetic modification. And actually, they, they will help the, they will sustain the PD1 expression in the fully exhausted T cells. And this is quite important for, for their responsiveness to PD1. Okay. Thank you. Um, another question here. So, are CD38 positive um, CD8 T cells, do they also use fatty acid oxidation to generate energy? Uh, for CD, I'm not really sure, but I don't know if they can do that because, you know, if you consider. Uh, if you CD36 expression in CDA it may help them to get the lipid, but the problem is that getting lipid doesn't doesn't means you can burn lipid. Mm. So if you want to burn lipid, you still need to have good mitochondria. And in the tumor micro environment, there's one another issue we also need to consider is hypoxia. The hypoxia condition may uh, may block those T cells' ability to burn fat. So I'm not really sure whether those T cells can really uh, utilize those fatty acids they get from CD36 that efficient. Okay. And kind of a follow-up to the online saying, so does targeting lipid metabolism in Tregs can it also affect CD8 function in TME? As uh, a ACAT1 deletion can improve CD8 anti-tumor function? So the ACAT1 deletion, I don't know. Um, this one, I think there are some reports already there. Uh, I don't remember the details, so I will not make the comment on that one. But I think targeting lipid metabolism uh, in TREC will affect the CDAT cell function. We didn't, I didn't show the data here, but actually in our original publication, you can see that if, if we compare the CDA TILs between Y-type and also the CD36 TREC specific knockout, 
those CD36 uh, T-Rex specific knockout, they have their CDA TOs actually have higher level of interferon gamma and TNA papa production. So it looks like targeting T-Rex lipid metabolism will allow the entire microenvironment to become less immunosuppressive and CDA can exert stronger anti tumor response. Okay. Um, I guess this is more a general one, but uh, considering the changes in metabolism in cancer, does diabetes also promote cancer development? Would that be fair to assume? Very open-ended so, question. It's a pretty open end. So actually, there are some report, um, I would say pretty confusing report, but I think both all of them make some sense in certain degree. But I, my personal impression is that um, diabetes were associated with uh, cancer formation and also poor prognosis, and that's pretty um, well accepted. But whether this will affect their responsiveness to PD-1 blockade is hard to say, especially based upon the information we have for the lactin uh, signaling in the T cells and also the lipid composition. I think this is something a lot of people, they try to work on that and try to figure out because based on retro perspective analysis, you can see both ends. Mm. And there's a paper I remember in Nature Medicine also discussed about this possibility, especially lactin signaling. No. Okay. Uh, more technical question here, but uh, what percentage of tumor condition media did you use in those experiments? So we use 80%. If you use 100%, actually, you will be quite toxic. So okay. we use 80% so we can still save those cells for the, for the following experiment. Okay. Um, this one, uh, how do you rule out the other members utilizing NAD after the NAD supplementation? I think that's... Other members? Uh, yeah. In the NAD supplementation, we did in vitro analysis. So we give those t rex NAD in vitro in the presence of conditional media. So I don't know whether, I don't know the other member means uh, other immune cells or other enzymes. Uh, but in terms of the, the, the assay system, I think it's already quite pure, only T-Rex in that system. We didn't analyze this one in vivo. Um, and I've got one question myself. So. Um which goes on to the sort of circular recirculation of NAD and the, your um, complex activity of complex one. But the use of metformin in this case then, which is, I think has been used quite a bit in other sort of cancer areas, would it be detrimental in this case for T-Rex? Metformin? Yeah. That's a very interesting question, especially metformin's uh, anti-tumor response is quite, is quite interesting. So mm -hmm. I would still believe metformin can target intratumor T-Rex in certain way. But, you know, using metformin in vivo is too dirty because metformin can also target dendritic cell macrophage and also CDA T cells. Okay. Uh, so, but in, if you do the in vitro experiment, I would, I guess, my, my gut feeling is that you will also see very similar phenotypes we report here. Those T-Rex treat with metformin, they might die, and they may, they may lose their survival ability uh, if we culture them in the conditional medium from cancer cells. Hmm. Okay, and uh, again, this is quite an open-ended question, I think, but can T-Rex cells be used with stem cells instead to cure cancer? That's a very okay, big question. Use with stem cell. Yeah. Uh, I'm not really sure what does yeah. this mean. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, maybe the uh, whoever typed that in can put in some a follow up question for us. Uh, and I think we've got through all the questions now. We'll just hang on for another five seconds to see if we get any more questions in. No problem. <laughs> Okay, well, there's no more questions. So thank you again, Ping Che, for a great presentation. Very, very much appreciated. Thank and thank you thank for you. our audience for um, tuning in. Oh, well, here we go. One last question. Did you okay. try the same in PD-1 resistant tumors? So the one we did actually is PD-1 resistance. For the BRP-10 okay. melanoma system, they don't respond to PD-1. Okay. And we, we did both induced persistent and also engraftment system. 
So basically, the CD36 treatment alone is already elicits better anti-tumor response compared with PD-1. Basically, PD-1 doesn't work. But once we combine, we see further uh, further improvement. I think it might be it might indicate that if you target TREX, you may have you may help those CDAT cells to become less exhausted because only the less exhausted or uh, progenitor exhausted T cell can respond to PD-1 block K. So I think the presence of uh, immunosuppressive T-rex and tumor microenvironment can drive uh, the terminal exhaustion. So I think our data also suggests this possibility. Okay, that's great. Okay, well, that's the end of the questions. Again, thank you very much, Pinche, for a great uh, presentation. And um, thank you again for our audience for tuning in. Thank you. Thanks. Goodbye.